Chapter 90. The Curtains. Exodus chapter 26, verses 1 to 14. Thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet. With cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. The length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits, and every one of the curtains shall have one measure. The five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. And thou shalt make loops of blue upon the edge of the one curtain from the selvage in the coupling, and likewise shalt thou make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in the one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold one of another. And thou shalt make fifty tashes of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tashes, and it shall be one tabernacle. And thou shalt make fifty loops on the edge of the one curtain that is outmost in the coupling, and fifty loops in the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second. And thou shalt make fifty tashes of brass, and put the tashes into the loops, and couple the tent together that it may be one. And the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tents, the half curtain that remaineth, shall hang over the back side of the tabernacle, and a cubit on the one side, and a cubit on the other side of that which remaineth in the length of the curtain of the tent, it shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram's skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger's skins. Exodus chapter 26, verses 1 to 14. As far as most people are concerned, Few biblical passages can equal this one for dullness. It is a technical account of certain aspects of the tabernacle. There are three in all. First, there is the Mishkan, or dwelling place, in verses 1-6. to six. Second, there is the Ubel, or tent erected over the dwelling place to protect it, verses 7-13. to 13. And third, there is a further covering to protect the tent, Verse 14. The dwelling place was made of the best quality linen. Images of the cherubim were embroidered on it, an interesting fact. What the Ten Commandments forbid is not artwork per se, but the worship of anything depicted by painting, sculpture, or any like art. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. If the common misinterpretation were logically held, photography would have to be banned. This dwelling place was divided in two by the curtains to make the Holy of Holies, a perfect cube, and the holy place. The tent over the dwelling place was made of goat's hair, and over it was another covering of badger's skins, although some read the word as sea cows. The word tashes means clasps, the ark and the mercy seats were in the Holy of Holies, and the table for the showbread and the lampstand were in the holy place. These requirements stress again that the tabernacle is a royal tent, a dwelling place for the king of creation. Beauty, glory and privacy are stressed. Because today tents have a limited use, they are made simply and plainly, Thus we forget that once their construction was often very costly, ornate and made for long-term use. Similarly, because people today move frequently, houses are less often constructed with the generations to come in mind. Our perspectives are short-term, with sometimes sorry consequences for men and societies. The tabernacle has been called a foreshadowing of the Incarnation, God dwelling among men. The tabernacle had a framework of wood, five pillars or test poles, and apparently a ridge pole. 
According to George Rawlinson, the Holy of Holies was a cube of 15 feet in every direction, and the holy place was an oblong, 30 feet by 15. Outside was the court of the tabernacle. The fine twisted linen mentioned in verse 1 was, according to the ancient rabbis, linen in which every strand was made up of four threads. It is important now to examine an aspect of this text which has a curious relevance to our times especially. We live in an age which hates curtains and walls in some spheres of life, while insisting on privacy in others. The right to privacy has become a problem in law, as many insist on claiming as legal a right never formulated legally in the past. Very often this right to privacy means a freedom from all moral censure for acts previously regarded as illicit and immoral. Thus, homosexuals insist on their privacy while at times indulging in public acts. Their quote-unquote right is thus a claimed immunity from censure. This has been true in various spheres. Thus, the sexual revolution was marked by public fornication, not only at Woodstock, together with an insistence on immunity from condemnation. Films now routinely depict sexual acts, and all areas of life are regarded as non-private and open to scrutiny. The same is true with the media, of biographers, of some historians and others. A no-curtains world seems to be the goal of many. A good case could be made for the coincidence of a loss of freedom and a loss of godly privacy. At the heart of biblical faith is the blunt statement that there are things which it is our moral duty to know and other things which it is presumption for us to seek to know. Moses declares, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. This is a very important as well as neglected text. Those things which are revealed and which belong unto us and to our children forever are the words of God's law, the Bible. The secret things refers to God's predictions and his predestinating power. If God has ordained all things, what then is the point of doing anything? God's revelation, as in Deuteronomy chapter 28, gives what is clearly a bleak look at an apostate future. However, as P. E. Craigie pointed out, the purpose of these glimpses of God's predestination and total control is to motivate us into the responsibility of obedience. Man, a sinner, seeks to be as God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. He wants total knowledge of all things, including God. He is at war with curtains if they stand between him and the objects of his curiosity, there are two impediments to man in his ungodly demands for knowledge. First, he is a fallen creature, and his total being has been warped by sin, so that his attempts to know are clouded at best and usually perverse. Second, man is a finite creature whose capacity to understand and comprehend things infinite is simply lacking. Redeemed man can have true knowledge within the limits of his creaturely being, and no more. The secret things of God are eternally beyond man. His knowledge can still be valid, though limited, and the more man accepts his limitations, the better is he enabled to know things truly. More importantly, God, by his grace, enables man to know him. The Incarnation is God's self-revelation. It does not abolish the secret things, but it brings God closer to us and tells us what we need to know.
The curtains surrounding the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place are thus not only the decorations of a royal tent, but also revelatory of the fact that there are limits to our knowledge and vision. H. Wheeler Robinson called attention to another aspect of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, namely that these things which are revealed means not only God's law, but also that the known past with its lessons of obedience to the law is ours. This is a dramatic fact. It tells us that a presumptuous curiosity needs to be replaced by a godly historical sense and knowledge. The only curtains on the past are of man's own making. Men too often despise history because they are determined to transcend and abolish it. The grave is their destiny.